Um, all right, uh, as I say, if you want to get up and get some things, we're going to look at ankles for the next 30 minutes. Um, it's an easy ankle and some foot stuff as well. We're going to look at this literature that kind of talks about it. It's, a, it's um, what do we got here? We got about uh, 30 papers. So this is a little more manageable than the knee thing, and we can get into it in a little more deal, uh, detail. This is one of, obviously one of the most common presentations to the emergency room and to an office. It's a very uh, kind of straightforward. Ankles are pretty examinable for the most part. We're going to deal with who needs an x-ray and what to do about it. One of the things that looks at uh, ankles that I think is really important to note, and emergency physicians I think do uh, not such a good job at it, and the people who are in primary care have to face this a lot more, which is that a fair number of people with ankle injuries have fairly prolonged courses and prolonged disability. A bad sprain, I'm not just talking fractures, a bad sprain leaves someone with a fair amount of pain. Um, there is some need for PT. There are residual problems in laxity. Abstracts 25 and 26 talk a little bit about that. And there's a big risk for repeat injury. One of the biggest problems with sprains with younger people is as you tell them, okay, you need to strengthen your ankle and you need to give it time to heal because you have a partial ligamentous tear, usually involving the talofibular ligament and some of the associated ligaments on the lateral side, since inversion is far and away the most common mechanism. And they do that for a couple, three weeks, and then they return to the activity that hurt them in the first place a lot of times. And it's a lot of times they're recreational activities like basketball or tennis or whatever it is that they like to do, and they re-injure it. And re-injuring ankles adds substantially to what the length of disability that they'll have. I played soccer and, uh, for, as a, a younger person for a long, long time, and I have absolutely no ligamentous stability left in my right ankle. And so when I twist my ankle anymore, it just can't, I can't sprain it anymore. There's nothing to sprain. I go, bone, I go right to bone on bone, and it doesn't hurt so much when I do that as long as I don't fracture it. Now, the good news about an ankle, and one of the things that's fundamentally different about that is while I have that degree of laxity and, dis and uh, injury to my right ankle, it's not unstable. The ankle is a deep and relatively stable joint that's fairly well evolved for bipedal locomotion. Um, intelligent design aside, um, uh, uh, you'll have to pardon me, but a long time ago when we were apes, we decided to come out of the trees and walk on our back legs. Um, and there's all kind of, I'm Irish, so the, one of the popular jokes on this is why is the wheelbarrow the greatest Irish invention? And the answer is it taught the Irish people to walk on their hind legs. Um, uh, and the, the good news here is, is that the ankle is actually pretty well adapted for walking on your hind legs. It's a deep joint. It has a fair amount of intrinsic bony stability. As opposed to the knee, the knee is not really that well evolved for bipedal locomotion, uh, bipedal locomotion and is a really fairly unstable. The knee is great if you're on all fours. Knees are much more stable in dogs and other animals that are on all fours, but the knee, once you start getting your whole weight up and over it and you've got a balance on your condyles, it's not so good, which is why we care so much about ligamentous injuries because the ligaments are so much more important. And then, of course, the other reality of walking on your hind legs is uh, that you will have back pain, period. Period. I mean, you know, when people say, well, what, doctor, why do I have back pain? It's because you walk on your hind legs. Um, that's really what the reason is, and, and the cure for it is, um, you know, to stop walking on your hind legs or get used to it, really. Who needs an x-ray? So we're going to go right into the auto ankle rules. As I said, these rules are important. I chart them routinely. There are real savings here. There's real savings in radiation exposure, although the radiation exposures obviously for an ankle series are low and not directed at anything that important. But abstract two is the typical stuff. Ian Steele sets the stage, says there's wide variance of, pro of practice. There's a lot of negative x-rays, and that was back in 1992. That's the basis. This is how you do these papers. Abstract 93 is the original auto ankle rule studies where he develops the decision rule and says the decision rule is um, that you're unable to bear weight, you don't have pain at the base of the fifth metatarsal, right? They don't want you to miss a fifth metatarsal fracture at Dancer or Jones, um, and, and that you have bony tenderness at the posterior fibula, posterior fibula, or the tip of the fibula, but you don't examine the anterior aspect of the fibula because that's where the insertions 
of the talofibular ligaments are and where 90, you know, 95 percent of sprains are going to involve those ligaments. So if you examine the anterior margin of the distal fibula, you're going to find a lot of tenderness in people with sprains. And so specifically the rule says posterior fibula, tip of fibula, because there's those tip avulsion fractures, and then mid major bony tenderness areas. And if you can walk and you don't have those things, you don't need x-rays, and you'll decrease x-rays. In abstract three, they decrease x-ray by 35%. Abstract four, they said, okay, let's implement it and see how we did. X-rays went from 83 to 60%. Satisfaction stayed high. ED time was reduced, throughput was increased, and there were no important misses. Abstract five is a GW evaluation, said the sensitivity was 100%. It's an American population, more finicky about getting their x-rays. We know a lot of people come in, what they want is an x-ray. They want validation. They feel that they need that, that radiation therapy is the first step in the management of an ankle injury. And so Americans couldn't decrease the number of x-rays as much, but they still decreased them by 90%. 19% rather, so that's pretty good. Abstract six is, as I said, once there's a big swing of literature in one direction, there'll be some naysayer articles, and there are two important naysayer articles. Six is one of them. It's by Lucchesi, and if you really want to be entertained, read the rebuttal letter to the editor by Ian Steele about Lucchesi's review of the auto ankle rules, where he pointed out that the reason you found that the auto ankle rules didn't work is because there was some problem with reading. You didn't read what the Ottawa ankle rules were, and if you actually had applied them, they would have worked. Abstract 7 says, is a French study which says they work. They decreased x-rays by 22%. Abstract 8 is a Cincinnati study that says they work. And Abstract 9 is a British study that works and says they decreased x-rays by 30%. They said they had a few misses. It wasn't as flattering a paper, but the misses were all fractures that would have been managed like sprains. So if you have a distal avul if you have a little avulsion on the tip of your fibula, most of those are going to be managed as a sprain would be. And so one of the things I, I use as sort of a rule in medicine when you look at international papers, if the French and the British can agree, it really works. Okay? So for example, they, they don't agree on a whole lot of things. So for example, the French and the British agree that high dose steroids for spinal trauma isn't that good a deal that the Bracken's original work is that good. So whenever you see a French and British alignment of the stars, you kind of have to think, this probably works. And I, think, I don't think anyone here should doubt that the Ottawa ankle rules work. You should probably integrate them if you haven't already into your practice. I integrate them right into my charting. I'll indicate no x-rays indicated by Ottawa ankle rules. You need to know them and employ them systematically. And then the final question that always comes up, well, what do you do when the patient really isn't happy with that? I, I do my best pitch. I examine them. I talk to them about the auto ankle rules. I tell them that we have these rules to help us identify who needs x-rays and that x-rays are cumulative in terms of the radiation and things like that. And if the person really is not happy with that, well, then I probably do what most of you do here, which is I recognize that I've never won an argument with a patient. Now, and part of this, now, if a patient wanted an MRI, a $2,000 study, I can't, I'm not going to, you know, if we get into an argument about that where I really don't think it's indicated, then you kind of got to stick to your guns. But the fact of the matter is I wouldn't recommend for anyone in this room that you stick to your guns about an ankle x-ray. If you're getting into, you know, why would you destroy a doctor-patient relationship over an ankle x-ray? I just, it's just, it's pointless. Plus, then they write a letter to the director about this doctor who was rude to them and wouldn't do it. And so I yield. I, I do my best to employ them, and I find that, again, I find sort of like the papers would imply that you do save x-rays. How many do I say? 15 to 20 percent probably would be about right, which is a, that's a very meaningful saving, given how common ankle presentations are. But I don't... I, I, and I would encourage you here, too, not to get embroiled into this thing, kind of thing where someone really feels they need an x-ray. And I'm very direct with them. You know, I don't think you need an x-ray. If, you know, if you're my family, I wouldn't do it. Here's the, what the auto ankle rules say. And then I ask them, are you comfortable with that? And if they do that, well, I really feel like I, I need to know or I should have an x-ray, I, I tell them what the, how sure these, the rules are and things. And if I'm still feeling like I'm, I'm losing them, then fine. They can have an x-ray. I don't care. Do they work in peds? Apparently, the person who wrote this chapter has a phobia of the number of a number 11. So we go from abstract 10 to abstract 12. Um, but in peds, there was some suspicion that maybe they wouldn't work in peds. 
And the reason that suspicion existed is because in Peds, remember, you remember the staying, you probably, many of you remember, maybe not all of you were told this craziness, but I remember very clearly being told in medical school, adolescents don't get sprains. And the reason they don't get sprains is because the ligamentous insertions are stronger than the epiphyseal uh, growth plates, and so they have a tendency to have Salter 1 fractures more than sprains, and so particularly at the wrist, where it's very common, and a little bit at the ankle, you should be suspicious that they have a Salter 1 fracture rather than a sprain. And so that's one, sort of the standard thing. Now, it's obvious that adolescents do get sprains. I mean, who's more active than an adolescent? They sprain their ankles and they sprain their wrists all the time, but the point that you ought to be suspicious that they could have a Salter 1 fracture is out there. And, you so, and then the question then would be, is the exam and the auto ankle rules just as reliable? And so I don't think it was a gimme that they would be, but it turns out that they work out quite well. So abstract 12 looks at PEDS at Case Western and says sensitivity remained 100%, negative predictive value stayed 100%. Abstract 13 is a British study in 700 plus walking children said it works fine. Abstract 14 at University of Colorado in London, Ontario uh, said that they decreased x-rays by 23%, but there was one thing, if you read that paper, you might say, oh, wait a minute, this is the lowest number I've heard anywhere on here, because they said the sensitivity was 83%. That wouldn't be good enough for a decision rule overall. This is the only paper that goes that low, but this one kind of points to this question about PEDS, and they said that there was a Salter-Harris-1 distal fibular fracture in some of these, and that the negative reports, the negatives and the lower sensitivity was related to this Salter-Harris-1 issue. So you should be a little careful with it in kids because of the Salter-Harris-1 issue. So if they've got tenderness right over their growth plate, then you might go ahead and get an x-ray, even though growth plate tenderness isn't part of the rule per se. So I would, I would add that out there if you want to think about it, or if you have someone that you're concerned that you're thinking, geez, maybe I should x-ray them even though the auto ankle rules were negative, and then you go and feel their growth plate and it's tender, then I would say go ahead with your instincts on the basis of that paper. Abstract 15 and 16 ask the question, which is can a nurse practitioner or a nurse in triage apply these rules and appropriately order x-rays? on people who need them and not get them on the others. And abstract 15 says that they did an instruction sheet and they did pretty well. There were no re-evals. Um, <clears throat> there was no, uh, they did a two month follow up period to see if there were misses and it worked fine. Abstract 16 found the same thing for nurse practitioners that their sensitivity of, and when they use these was 98%. There were five fractures found at follow up. So the 98%, the 2% that were missed were five fractures found at follow up. All those fractures managed like a sprain. So didn't need casting, didn't need immobilization, managed with ACE wraps and partial weight bearing just as you would a sprain. And so that was a pretty good. And then there's some papers here that look at the international usage uh, varying and found that there are some places use them a lot more than others. So in places like Spain, where emergency medicine has had a very slow evolution compared to other European countries, they uh, only 21% of the clinicians that they surveyed were aware of the auto ankle rules. So I think most everyone here is aware of them, how much we, we use them as variable. Abstract 18 talks about the uptake of the validated guidelines and pointed out that or uh, the auto ankle rules were not, as, not maintained as necessarily as we would like. And this is one that I really think should be brought in and maintained. Abstract 19 says they're highly cost effective. Uh, even, and by the way, 18 is an unusual paper because in a lot of times when people look at cost effectiveness, they ignore a few bad outcomes. For example, if you looked at a cost effectiveness um, series on navicular fractures at the wrist, and you said, we find 98% of them and we manage 99% of them right, and right then, so there was 1% left over. Well, if that 1% produced medical legal activity and resulted in a suit, the cost, time, and money of that suit should be factored into the cost analysis, and they often don't do that and not to mention the headache for the clinician involved and being involved in that suit. And so Abstract 19 is an interesting paper in that they did a sensitivity analysis and they even factored in the cost of an occasional lawsuit to, to the analysis to say that even if you factored those things in, the Ottawa ankle rules were cost effective. And so I like that paper a lot because it did that. How satisfied are patients with the rule? Well, that obviously depends on, one, your patients, and it depends on, two, your ability to communicate and to convince them 
uh, without browbeating them and get them to buy into the whole concept. And this is, these satisfaction things are just like all the satisfaction papers we've ever looked at, whether it's with low back pain, whether it's antibiotics for colds, etc. And one of the things it says over and over again in satisfaction is we have some trouble reading them. We know that some people won't be satisfied without x-rays, but we don't really know who those people are because they hold, they do, as everyone does here in Vegas, they hold their cards close. You don't know whether they're going to hold or fold. And so my, my logic to you on that is I don't try to guess. I don't try to read them. I give them the pitch. I tell them what I think. And then I say, I just ask them straight up, are you comfortable with this? And, and let them know, yes, if you're not comfortable, We'll do something about it. If, you're, if you are comfortable, again, I just don't want to get loggerheaded with them about it. And so since the literature all says it's hard to know who's happy with what you're doing, I just ask them. All right. <clears throat> Once you need x-rays, which x-rays do you need? So they failed the auto ankle rules. You go to get x-rays. And there's uh, a paper here by Vangs Ness, number 21, that says that you don't really need an AP lateral and mortise. You can just get an AP and lateral. And that will be good enough. And that the mortise doesn't add much information. I frankly disagree. If I'm going to get x-rays, I'm going to get the three-view series. Now, this paper was done at my institution at LA County, and I'll just tell you, while this paper was done, and it was part of Banks Ness's promotion package as, a, as faculty, you know, we all got to do our publication stuff, we didn't integrate this into the practice at the hospital. We don't do. So, even though, so you might think, if this is so good, why didn't we integrate this? And it's because there is some resistance. And, and I think that a mortise view actually does tell me important things. So even in someone who has a really bad sprain who failed the auto ankle rolls because they have so much pain and can't bear weight, the mortise view tells me how, how the tailored dome is sitting into the appropriate spot. If those spaces aren't even around the top, then I'm not happy with that. And it lets me know that this is likely to be perhaps a third degree sprain with complete ligamentous disruption. So if I'm going to x-ray him, I'm going to get all three views. Uh, so my read is a little bit different from 21, and I just offer that up. It's, the literature says you could drop down. And by the way, what do they say that the sensitivity for two views is, if you look at the paper carefully? They say 93 to 98%. Well, wait a minute. If, I, if I've already eliminated the unnecessary x-rays, and now I'm trying to get the x-rays on the people who need them, I'm not really comfortable missing 1 in 50 or 1 in, 1 in 25. If it's 96% and 4% are misses, I don't want to miss those. And so once I decide to get the x-rays, I personally want the full series. I think the paper could be spun the other way to say that two views aren't good enough. If it's only 93%, if that's the lower end of what the paper says, I don't like that. <clears throat> Abstract 22 looks at 12,000 x-rays ordered by clinicians around and says, where do we miss things? And we do miss things, obviously. Now, I don't want to get into, you know, someone up here might need a Haldol blow dart if I start talking about radiologists too much, so I'll have to be a little careful and so I don't get out of bounds here. But when we miss an x-ray, it's assumed that the radiologist is the gold standard. And certainly in a, on, on difficult reads, I would yield that. But on plain films and extremity reads, I'm always telling the residents, and I'm a broken record on this, that I don't really care what the radiologist said because the radiologist didn't examine the patient. And I firmly believe, and I think it's an axiom of medicine, that exam plus x-ray is greater than x-ray, no matter how much you know about x-ray. So if you think the person hurts in an area and you see a fleck that the radiologist didn't call, why would you assume the radiologist was the gold standard when you've examined them and know where they hurt? The same is true with Salter 1 and Salter 5 fractures. The radiologist is not the gold standard. So there's, we have actually done a whole segment on this at other times in the, in the abstracts. And let me, although it's not addressed in this one paper, let me just tell you what it says. And when you look at misses in, in, in emergency medicine and office-based practice, particularly of extremities, the miss rate appears to be about 4%. Now, of that 4%, 3 to 4%, Half the time, when it's subsequently adjudicated by multiple people, it turns out that the emergency physician is doing the overread or the office physician is doing the overread. We're right. So half the time, we're right. So if we said it was, it was 3%, 1.5% of the time, we're right and they were wrong. 1.5% of the times, they were right and we were wrong. But that still isn't the end of the story. Of the 1.5% where they were right, you then have to ask, was the difference between our read and their read did it produce a change in therapy? And of the 1.5% where they were right and we were wrong, meaningful changes in therapy occur in less than half of those. 
probably more like a third of those. And so the miss rate is really quite low when you get to it. I love it when a radiologist overreads and finds something that I miss. I, you know, I, I got no problem with that. I got a problem with how rich they get doing that. Um, but um, um, I don't have a problem with the overread. This paper does say that face series, fortunately we don't get those much anymore, had a 9% miss rate. Neck films, 6.5% miss rate. Mandible films, 5%. C-spine, 4%. Ouch. But for this talk, the important thing is to note that foot and ankles had about a 4% miss rate. And so you got to look at these carefully with exam. One of the things I'm always struck by is how sometimes serious foot injuries have really difficult x-rays to read. And, one, and in this miss group of important misses, Liz Frank fractures show up over and over and over again. And so missed midfoot and arch of foot. Remember, there's two arches of the foot. There's a longitudinal arch of the foot and a transverse arch of the foot. And the relationship of the second metatarsal to the midfoot is the keystone of both of those arches. And so you need to look at that quite carefully. Abstract 23 talks about occult ankle fractures. Now, occult ankle fractures means occult by x-ray in this paper. That's important to note because occult by exam would be a big problem. How so? If there were actually occult ankle fractures by exam, then the Ottawa ankle rules wouldn't work. And so anytime someone wants to talk about occult fractures, you've got to ask, occult how? So this was occult by x-ray. These were people who would have failed the Ottawa ankle rules, who then went and got x-rays and said, shit, I don't see anything. How often did it happen? Well, it wasn't as rare as you might think. 33 out of 1,150 x-rays were negative on their films, negative reads. They were occult on their reads. And they said that when you suspect that, when the person really can't bear weight, their x-rays look negative, one, get more views. We're back to the Vang's Nest paper. Get me at least an AP lateral and mortis. I don't want to have occult ankle fractures. And two, they say, yes, you can go ahead and get CTs if you want to. And they offered in this paper something that I don't routinely do, but it's an interesting concept, which is if you really think someone's got a bad ankle and they can't bear weight, but you don't see anything on the x-ray, they say, look at the ankle joint effusion. If the anterior amount of the effusion coming out, so that's the dark space and the displacement of the soft tissues, plus the posterior dark space adds up to greater than 15 millimeters, you could use that as a trigger to say, I'm going to CT this ankle, which is a weird order to write, right? CT the ankle. You can imagine how that call would go. You want a CT what? Um, and so that's kind of a, an important paper that says there are some rare cases. You could use the ankle effusion as a way to help you get there. They describe it in great detail. I got to say, while I look at ankle effusion, uh, while I look at joint effusions all the time in the knee, I look at joint effusions all the time in the elbow, I'm not in the habit of looking at them that much in the ankle. And so this paper describes looking at them in the ankle and what you're looking for and what the number is, the key number being greater than 15 millimeters A and P summed. Okay, complete ligamentous disruption in unstable ankles, the grade three sprain. We got two papers on that by this single Dutch author that talks about how should you diagnose these and there's a different ways to do it. You could do arthrograph an arthrogram of the ankle. You could do an advanced imaging study like a CT or an MR, or you could do a delayed exam. Again, since most ankles don't get emergent repair, I think this author reaches a, reaches a reasonably good conclusion, which is that a delayed exam. So you're going to put them non-weight bearing. You're going to put them in whatever support measures you're going to use. And then you can do a delayed exam on them rather than doing an invasive arthrogram or expensive later imaging. And what does he reach the conclusion with? That a delayed exam looking for an anterior drawer sign, major hematomas, persistent ligamentous pain, persistent instability is just as good as arthrography or advanced imaging. And so I like the conclusion of that. It's one of the few papers, these papers, there aren't a huge number of papers on the completely unstable ankle. And so I like those that say it's okay to stop. Now, if the orthopod wants to image them up later, I'm fine with that. Go ahead. Well, I admit ankles that have, that have fractures that require surgery, um, but no, for ankle sprains, for, no, no. I, I can't imagine a reason other than comorbidities for which I would go there. Now, here's, a, here's something that I really don't want to know the answer to, but there's some papers on it. Abstract 27 is a systematic Irish review of 22 trials where they ask the question, does RICE, rest, ice, compression, and elevation work? 
come on, do I, is there no room for art of medicine anymore? Can't I recommend some things that haven't been proven? Do I really have to ask permission to give out a $1 ace wrap and recommend an ice pack? All right, have at it. They looked, they did a 10 point quality score on these papers and the quality, guess what the quality was? Hint, the papers were written largely by orthopedists. Quality was averaged three out of 10. They were doing good. <clears throat> and um, some of the papers dealt with post-op patients. And they said there really wasn't that much good data. I don't care. I think I'm going to continue with rest, ice compression, and elevation. By the way, in terms of ice and pain, there is really good data. Ice, any time you substitute an alternate sensory modality for someone who's got a hurt location or a soon-to-be hurt location, we know that the amount of information that your efferent fibers can carry is limited. And Melzack, um, who wrote this book in Canada at the Montreal Neurologic called The Puzzle of Pain, really did all the groundbreaking work on this. But we know, and the dentists know, when the dentist is about to inject you up there, what do they do? They do this thing. They do the thing where they do it. They're going to substitute pressure sensation so that you don't feel the needle poke because your cheek is going to be saying, pressure, pressure, I'm waiting for the needle, pressure, 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 needle, pressure. And so you don't feel the needle so much. Whereas if they didn't do that, you'd be like, needle, 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 needle. And the same thing is with the ankle. It's got a limited amount of information it can carry. And so if you do nothing for it, it will be just be pain, 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 pain. We know that is a throbbing ankle. And if you put an ice pack on it, it will be pain, pain, cold, cold, pain, cold, cold. So you can overload them with an alternate sensory modality. And although none of the literature has found, would you expect an outcome change? You know, what outcome are you looking for unless you're just going to measure continuous pain scores? So I would say, leave it be. <clears throat> now, how to immobilize the ankle? 28, systematic review, 22 adults. They looked at cast versus boot versus splint versus ace. And what they really found out is, is that functional immobilization, whenever you can, meaning that the ankle still has some range of motion, prevents frozen joints. And so while there are serious ankle injuries where you're going to just cast them and treat them up front, that should be the minority. And the reason is, is that the functional outcomes are still the best. And this paper says that, um, that when you use functional outcomes, there's, that the outcomes are still the best. By fully immobilizing the ankle, there's no decrease in recurrence rate. There's no increase in stability. But there is an increase in the rate of frozen joints. And so you shouldn't fully immobilize an ankle sprain except in the rare cases where the person really needs it. Most of the time, they should get functional mobilization. Abstract 29 is a Cochrane paper which looks at the various functional mobilization techniques, and a lot of these just depend on what's available to you. Why is an ACE wrap not necessarily the best of those? And the reason is that an ACE wrap doesn't prevent inversion. It provides joint stability and provides some support, but it doesn't prevent inversion. And so what they say, what this paper basically says is that the best immobilizing technique is a functional mobilization techni immobilization technique that allows them to plantar flex and dorsiflex, but not invert or evert. And so the things that do that best are things like cam walkers, air cast, some of the lace wrap up, so all of those work really well. Which one you choose and which one you employ is probably going to depend on cost considerations and availability considerations. None of them is tremendously superior to the others. But there's one immobilization technique that got low, low marks in this Cochrane review, and that was taping. Why is that? That really is not fair. I don't think taping is the best thing. Who gets taped? Athletes, Athletes who are going to do what? return to an activity that you don't want them to do. So no matter, I mean, I mean, you know, the taping of basketball players and sports people, they tape so that they can still wear their athletic apparel, spikes, sneakers, et cetera, because taping doesn't prevent that. You can't really play basketball in a cam walker. You look pretty stupid. Um, and so taping, not surprisingly, has a bad outcome because by definition, the people who get taped are going back to an activity you as a doctor wouldn't recommend they go back to. And then... Um, Abstract 31 is a fun paper that talks about um, pain control and is an ankle fracture an anti is, a, is an ankle fracture an inflammatory process? Primarily, no. Is there some inflammation associated with the blood and the soft tissues when all the you know someone's got all that blood along their Achilles tendon and pooling in the base of their foot and there's all this soft tissue and there's some torn stuff and leakage of maybe of leakage of joint fluid if they have a capsular injury? Is there some inflammation associated with that? Yes. So the question is, what should you do? And, and we, we joke sometimes at county about the, 
you know, the astrophysics and, and particle physics of joint pain management. And there's two subatomic particles. So everyone knows there's neutrons and protons, but there's the motrinos and the vicodinos. And the question is, should you go with the primarily with the motrinos or the vicodinos? And my feeling is, is that motrin has such a narrow therapeutic index compared to the vicodinos that I don't use motrin that much. By the way, if you are using motrin, since it's not primarily an inflammatory condition, you should know that the ceiling dose of Motrin is 800 for anti-inflammatory effect. The ceiling dose of Motrin for analgesic effect is 400. So if you're writing an ankle sprain for 600 of Motrin, you're saying you believe it's an inflammatory condition, which it primarily isn't. And so I would say, use more Vicodin, use less Motrin. We probably don't ask people nearly enough whether they have GI problems, renal problems, and other problems before we, you know, do the Motrinos. And I know from, you know, you know, ankle sprains hurt. A short course of Vicodin, rest, ice, compression, elevation seems fine. So I think that's what the science says. And there's that last paper there says that Motrin does work, but it's not a particularly compelling paper on the topic.